Welcome to the NSCHBC Edge Podcast, leading the way in the business of medicine. Now here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NSCHBC Edge Podcast. I'm your host, Terry Fletcher. The Edge Podcast is brought to you today by the National Society of Certified Healthcare Business Consultants. Our goal is to discuss healthy business principles, have conversations on the business side of medicine so that you and your practice can thrive, be profitable, and successful for years to come. My expertise in the medical field is focused on coding, billing, reimbursement, auditing, and basically the entire revenue cycle management. But the business of medicine is also about legal issues in healthcare, regulatory restrictions and flexibilities, especially during the pandemic, practice management, and of course, the financial and accounting end of a medical and or dental practice. So with that in mind, today's topic will be focused on provider relief funding and all the money that has been pushed out over the past year during the COVID public health emergency to assist providers and hospitals during this time. To talk to me about that, or talk with me, I should say, is Jennifer Pemble. Jennifer is a CPA, CFE, and CHBC with Warren Averett in their healthcare division. Jennifer specializes in business consulting and tax planning for medical practices and healthcare facilities and is a fellow member of the NSCHBC. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Terry. I'm happy to be here. So we are very excited about this topic today, and I'm glad we get to dive into it, especially since we're on the beginning end, or I should say the beginning of tax season. And as you know, we've had a lot happening in the last year with COVID and the pandemic and medical practices, not only having to pivot to telehealth, but having to shut down elective surgeries and the constant shutting down and opening up of states with really no warning or um, you know, just no consistency of what's going to happen. And the healthcare industry has felt the chaos for sure. Not to mention that the providers dealing with overstaffing or understaffing, I should say, and overfilled ICUs, and then the physician practices trying to stay afloat. With this, there's been a change in government administration, as we know, provider relief money pushed out in grants, loans, offerings. And I just would like to discuss today all the kind of the breakdown of it for our listeners and make sure not only are they compliant in what they're reporting in this most challenging tax season ahead, but what your thoughts are as far as a, from an, an accounting expert on what's next. So first, can you explain the difference between all the provider relief funding? And there's a lot out there talking about HHS funding and uh, EIDL, uh, PPP, AAP. There's so much, and, and we'll get into the actual acronym definition, but can you start us off with you know what the HHS funding, when doctors woke up one day and said, wow, I've got a ton of money in my account. Sure, yeah, that was an interesting morning because we had lots of providers reaching out saying, I woke up and there's this big deposit from HHS, what is it? So th the first one is the HHS Provider Relief Funds, and these were stimulus funds provided to healthcare practices during the coronavirus pandemic. The first round came out around April 10th, and that was the morning that people woke up and looked in their bank accounts and had this money that had been deposited. There have been three rounds of these Provider Relief Fund payments. Some of them were automatically pushed out. Some of them practices had to apply for. Um, there's also been the EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Relief Loan. This is an SBA loan that came with a $10,000 grant. This loan is not forgivable, but the grant is. And it was a 30-year fixed 3.75% loan for businesses, no prepayment penalties or fines. So we did have some clients going out and looking to take out this SBA loan when they needed cash. And then we've also had these PPP loans. So these are Paycheck Protection Program loans. The first round of these came out early April. We began applying, I think April 3rd was the day that banks opened up and started taking applications. I remember because it was my birthday and we spent like 14 hours helping clients get everything ready to apply. Happy uh, birthday to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, these, the rules around the Paycheck Protection Program loans have changed from the day that they came out through today. There's been a number of changes on them. Um, so 
what I tell people is if you go to Google something and you want to learn about paycheck protection program loans, just look at the date on there because if you're reading something that's outdated, it may not be applicable anymore. So that was the first round of PPP loans started in April. And many people who took those out in 2020, their covered period has already ended. When President Trump signed the December 27th Act, that kind of led way to PPP round two. So banks just recently started opening up applications for PPP round two. And this is another round of PPP loans, but it's really intended to target small, business who, small businesses who have been hit the hardest by the pandemic. So the qualifications are a little different. It's a little more strict on who qualifies. The amount that you can qualify for is about the same as PPP round two. The caps are a little bit different. But in both of these PPP programs, there were rules around how you needed to use the funds to ensure that the SBA would forgive those loans. So that's the big thing with the PPP loans is that they can be forgiven and they are now officially non-taxable, which is great for these small businesses who have really been hit hard by the pandemic. Wow, that sounds amazing that they actually, you know, offer all of this. Now, my question is, and just to kind of to backtrack a little bit, so when the first HHS funds came out, and you know, and I noticed that there was a lot of conversation uh, through our society, um, and you know, on our listserv, and really talking about um, the changes. Like you said, one minute it said this, and then it kept changing and evolving as far as uh, the rules um, to get forgiveness on that. But one of the things that I noticed on all of this is that you had to have um, bookkeeping that reflected your losses, or at least the impact financially. Uh, from the pandemic on your practice. So my question is, is that for those practices that are basically getting the funding from all of these different options, is there a crossover? Do they have to show separate uh, expenses instead of, they can't use the same expense to get the different loan. Is that accurate? That's correct. Yeah. So with HHS and PPP, if you're using your PPP loan to pay your staff salaries, you can't also go to HHS and say, I'm using these provider relief funds to pay my staff salaries. You can't duplicate those expenses. And there have also been some tax credits out there if you're paying your staff um, and they're not able to work because of COVID. And again, you can't duplicate that. So if you take a tax credit for those wages, you can't also use PPP funds or HHS funds to pay those wages. Wasn't there also something that, and you mentioned, and just just triggered something you just said as far as if your staff wasn't able to work due to COVID. Now, they weren't able to work because either they're taking care of a family member, COVID, or they contracted COVID or, you know, whatever. But what if they refuse to come back to work because of whatever reason? They just feel that they don't want to work um, and do that. Did, wasn't there some kind of a rule as far as not being able to keep that funding or something? Not so much if they didn't want to come back. There were rules around you decreasing wages or hours for your employees or laying people off and not being able to keep funding. But if somebody's just not comfortable, I don't think that the provider would get hit for that. Okay. And then also for our listeners, there was some, one other uh, option out there, and I discouraged it for our, my clients. I, I'm, I don't know about what you did with yours, but the, it was called the AAP, and that's the Advanced and Accelerated Payments Through Medicare. That to me, as soon as I read it, I was like, no, 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 and no. <laughs> there's HHS funding. There's all these different, you know, PPP, the EIDL. But for those of you that are out there, that means that you are taking a loan against future payments and you have to pay it back there. Now they have delayed the the payback, but they're, they are going to start getting that money back in March. And I think a lot of providers were thinking that that was going to, uh, they could just, you know, Congress was going to say, oh no, we'll go ahead and forgive this too. But since it's based on what they, what Medicare anticipates coming in, 
they can't forgive it. So that that is actually a loan situation. I know that uh, I've said, if you got that and you did it against advice, pay it back. What did, what did you tell your clients? Yeah, Terry, I was on the same page with you. As soon as I read about that, my first thought was, this sounds like an accounting nightmare to try to figure out how much of your collections Medicare is withholding to pay this loan back each month. Thought that that doesn't sound good. And with all of the other options out there, let's not do this. So I had a few clients who did initially take that advance payment. And after talking with them, they decided to repay it. So I am thankful for that. But like you said, they have pushed out that starting period for when they have to start paying it back. So I think there's still time if anyone took it and they don't want to go through that process, they can still pay it back. That's what I read too, that they can still pay it back and just push, you know, don't even deal with it. Just pay it back and, and move on and deal with the other. Now, one of the things that I was wondering, and it always stems up, especially because we have lively conversations on our listserv and just making sure that, you know, when they're looking at the uh, the HHS funds, for example, and all this this funding that's going out there. Now, since they can't really cross over, you can't use one expense for the other, anything like that. What happens when you have a provider, and I've had some very big clients that have, you know, uh, four or five to 30 physicians where they've received funds for those physicians who retired or the physicians now receive the funds and they've decided they are going to retire or, you know, it, it's just not being, it's not being applied to physicians who are active? How does that work? I think it depends on the source of that funding. If it's a PPP loan and you received funds because that physician who's retiring's wages were included in the calculation, I think you're okay. As long as you can still use those funds to pay employee salaries, you'll be okay. For HHS, that was more based on, well, initially it was based on your Medicare collections, and then they went to 2% of your gross receipts from your most recent tax return. So the retiring physician's collections were in there, which affected how much you got, but I don't think that physician retiring should really affect it. As long as you use those funds on qualifying expenses, I think you should be okay. Okay. Well, that that's that's good to learn and to know. Um, one of the things that has been kind of put out there, and I, I mentioned the provider relief funds, that the new acronyms that are coming up, is there a difference between the CARES Act, the COVID relief bill, and the Economic Aid Act? There is. So the CARES Act is what was signed in on March 27th of 2020. That's the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. This included the funds for the first round of PPP loans, those $1,200 stimulus checks that the government sent out to individuals. It expanded some unemployment benefits. Um, offered the deferral of payroll taxes and allocated money to HHS for round one of the HHS provider relief funds. What's referred to as the COVID relief bill and the Economic Aid Act, I think those two terms get used interchangeably, but both of those relate to what President Trump signed on December 27th, which that included that the $600 stimulus checks to individuals that extended the FFCRA payroll tax credits for businesses through Q1 2021, um, made PPP round one truly non-taxable and gave us the funds for the SBA to do PPP round two. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it just you're, you're hearing all these different, all of a sudden somebody's in a conversation and they say COVID relief bill, and then you say, oh, okay, I know what you mean. And then somebody else talks about the same thing saying Economic Aid Act. I'm like, wait, is, did we get more money or some other, something else pushed out that I wasn't aware of? So a lot of these things are interchangeable. Yep. Okay. Now, one of the things just for the listeners, when we're talking about expenses and, you know, obviously payroll has been a big one 
and expenses that you're you're dealing with. One of the things, Jennifer, I wanted to ask you, and this came up in an article I think I was reading either in Time or in Forbes magazine, and they were saying that uh, on the uh, not just the HHS but on the PPP, if it is normal practice expense that you would have incurred without the pandemic, can you still put that against some of these funds as as an expense, you know, due to COVID and, and, you know, is that going to be qualified to keep some of the money? For PPP, I'd say most, most of the practices that I've worked with have been able to use the PPP funds entirely on payroll, which they would have had incurred anyway, but because of the pandemic, and not having as much coming in as collection in collections because they had periods of time where they were shut down without this PPP loan, they may have had to lay these people off. So the intent of the PPP loan was to help businesses keep their employees employed. So I think we're okay there. For, for the HHS funds, I think that is a little more of a gray area you know what expenses qualify and if you would have all, if you would have had those expenses anyway can they still qualify i don't know i think you you're probably seeing increased expenses for ppe which can qualify but i've also seen a lot of providers installing like different air filtration systems things in their ac units that will help filter the air um, touchless doors. I've had some practices install those. Those kind of expenses that they they may have still had if that was something that they wanted to put in, but it was something that they pushed forward with because of COVID and trying to be more safe. Actually, that, those are uh, great ideas or as far as um, great understanding what they can apply uh, those funds for to make sure that they were definitely related to the pandemic, which also just to put it out there for kind of more in my wheelhouse, there was a new CPT code created 99072 for PPE, which is that personal protective equipment. And that was for, you know, extra cleaning equipment, staff testing, bunt, you know, all of that, but nobody's paying for it. And Medicare said, we're not, no, this is what we gave you funds for. So I think along the lines of what you just said, the funding was to cover, you know, the expense of, of a lot of this uh, PPE stuff. Yeah. So moving forward, what do you recommend or what is your client recommendation when it comes to the second round of PPP loans? Because I know there's a spirit of the loans and you, you mentioned already as far as, you know, what the second round qualifications could be as far as um, those companies that really need it. But I remember when I applied for my PPP in, I think, when was it? In April, at the end of April, and I got it in five days. It was so fast, but mine was mm -hmm. under $10,000, so it was a blip. But my mine was because I started seeing clients that were saying, can we move our, you know, paying your invoice to 45 to 60 days instead of 30? So obviously not a panic, but you're like, uh oh, <laughs> you know, now you're seeing that people were kind of concerned. And then it changed in a couple of months. So, you know, I, I wouldn't have to revisit it, but I'm looking at clients of mine and I'm sure you've probably had yours that there's a, there's a concern from an anticipation standpoint, you know, what could happen and should clients, you know, how do we deal with that with also explaining to them that the spirit of the loan is who needs it, not necessarily who might need it. How, how do you address that? So when we heard about PPP round two coming out, you know, before guidelines were even put out there, we had people reaching out asking, you know, do I qualify? Can I apply? I'm like, okay, everyone, hold on. Let's, let's wait for guidelines to come out. So when the guidelines were released, I, I went through and I read them and I said, okay, here's what they need to do to qualify. I started pulling quarterly comparative financials for my clients to see step one, who met the first requirement, who had a, a loss in their collections of 25% or more during any one calendar quarter, 2020 versus 2019. That's really the first step looking at your financials, making sure that you meet that first set of criteria. Do I have a loss? 
if if they didn't, that was an easy conversation. Look, you don't qualify right now. If things change, we'll let you know. If they did look like they qualified from that standpoint, then the conversation really has to be a little more in depth because we have to talk about economic necessity. So on the application for PPP round two, you have to certify that current economic uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the business. This isn't something new. You had to certify that on round one as well, but it, it seems to me like they might be a little more strict with that this time. The day after PPP round two guidelines came out, the former commissioner with the SEC, Paul Atkins, was in the Wall Street Journal and he was talking about this economic uncertainty and ensuring that borrowers really need the funds before taking out the loan. Um, a congressional oversight commission has already been established. There's now an, a special inspector general for pandemic recovery and several other newly funded inspector generals who it seems will be aggressively investigating whether borrowers actually needed the funds and how the funds were spent. So the SBA wants borrowers to take these loans out in good faith. And a few things that I talk with my clients about and I want them to consider before we move forward with an application for round two is, are you going to lay people off if you don't get this loan? That's a good will question. this loan yeah. yeah will this loan save jobs because that's really the intention of the loan is to make sure that you keep your employees um, are you going to cut hours or cut wages if you don't get this loan do you have other sources of funding available do you have a line of credit that you can pull on if you don't need a whole lot of cash um, is your line of credit maxed out obviously if there's a business and all of their all of their other sources of funding have been tapped out, then they're kind of in a position where they really need this or they could go under or they could have to lay off their employees. Um, and then the other thing to think about, if, if you do have availability to another source of funding, how quickly can you get that money? Are you going to get that money in time to continue your business operations? If, if it looks like from from the financials that a business may qualify, you really need to sit back and have a, a deeper conversation or think about those questions. That, that's great advice. Uh, you know, I really like how you put that out there as far as, you know, there's going to be oversight, you know, economic uncertainty versus necessity. And uh, I think those are really some insightful um, questions that a lot of the clients and a lot of our listeners need to think about before they move forward with um, new funding or applying for any um, you know funding that comes up, especially in the in the PPP range. So, last tip and last thing I want to do as we wrap this up, as far as practices and providers and our clients pr uh, planning for 2021, what's the one thing that um, sometimes it's hard to keep it to one, but what's the one thing that you would have them do? Because I have a feeling this pandemic is going to extend through not, not as far as the severity, but just as far as, as what they're dealing with through the end of this year. I'd say the number one thing for me would be good record keeping, keeping your financials up to date in whatever accounting software you're working in keeping track of how you're spending all of these different funds. Like I said, when PPP round two guidelines came out and we realized that the first step was to look at comparative financials, if there's a business out there who doesn't keep up with their financials, maybe they don't record everything until you know every six months, well, it's gonna be hard for you to go and pull quarterly comparative financials. So we don't know what's gonna happen in 2021, but good record keeping, timely record keeping is always helpful. Thank you. And I agree with that 100% of great advice to our clients, to our listeners, and um, to anyone who, who's really involved in all of this funding as far as receiving it and then also applying for it. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. We really appreciate having you and I hope to have you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
And it's been just a, a great wealth of information. We hope our listeners really appreciated what we brought to you today. And we look forward to uh, talking with you again next month. And uh, everyone, make it a great day and a great month. And thank you for listening to the NSCHBC Edge podcast. Thank you for listening to the NSCHBC Edge podcast. Join us on the second Tuesday of each month as our consultants tackle the complexities of navigating the business of medicine. You can reach us on the web at nschbc.org, the National Society of Certified Healthcare Business Consultants.